IT, forging IT security experts. Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, it's Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV. I'm here at Black Hat USA 2012 in Las Vegas, and I'm talking with Bob Martin. Mm -hmm. He is an outreach lead for MITRE. Um, Bob, thank you so much for speaking with us. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Definitely. Now tell us what exactly is MITRE? So MITRE is a uh, not-for-profit company chartered to work in the public interest, and we run what are called federally funded research and development centers, but basically they're focused on different problem areas. And I actually work in a technical center which works across all of those. So I work on things that all those different areas of government, MITRE only works for the federal government, mm -hmm. um, have concerns about or problems and try to come up with approaches, solutions that make an impact on our customers. What are some of the concerns that your customers might have? Well, um, one of the big ones, and it's been the focus of my life for about 12 years now, is in cybersecurity. Um, basically, the fact that it was evolving, changing the technical solutions out in the market, didn't seem to work together, there's a lot of confusion, and yet more and more of the government and more and more of industry and just everybody's life had IT and networks and software and things just didn't seem to be coming together where in the world where we live, we expect things to be predictive, you know, do things the way they always did or things you can expect. Mm -hmm. And so um, the first thing we got involved with was when people talked about a vulnerability in a piece of software, different people gave it different names. So people who wrote advisories, it, telling people, be careful about this problem, or the vendor of the product when they warned their customers, or researchers who gave information about it and advice, tool vendors who actually found the issue and tried to report it to the customers. They all use different n ways of talking about that, and if you were sitting there trying to use that information, it just made no sense. Right. And all of the solutions that were being talked about at the time were about taxonomies, about structures and how do you understand this weakness, this problem in relation to this other. And we had an epiphany. Um, one of my colleagues, Dave Mann, was uh, doing an exercise and he read an article in Scientific America about how many hundreds of years people talked about gold and silver and the other elements before the periodic table oh, wow. became obvious. And we said, well, maybe we're all trying to do the periodic table of vulnerabilities and really we ought to just make sure we're talking about the same thing. Right. And that was the beginning of the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures Effort, CVE. And today I would offer you can't find anybody in the vulnerability space who doesn't make use of CVE to correlate different information sources, yeah. even when they're competitors. Nice. So you standardize the, the terminology. Right. And it's unfortunately still growing. We're at 51,000 plus. And so one of the other initiatives we got going about five, six years ago w was basically, well, what are the root causes of all of these vulnerabilities? Why do they keep showing up in these software products? Is it that, you know, people are just stupid or maybe there's something more deep about it? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that we actually weren't educating the developers, the testers, the project leads that are building all these software products about the things that a lot of security practitioners were very aware of. And so we basically put together under a lot of NDAs um, information from all those researchers and tool vendors about what goes wrong in software and how to find it, what is it, what's the impact, how do you mitigate it, and that's the common weakness enumeration. And pretty much today, if you go out in the application security scanning market, all of the products, all the service suppliers tag their findings with CWEs, but more importantly, when you're teaching people about software and how to make it secure, reliable, resilient. Because it's not just about security, it's about the thing doing what you want it to do when something unexpected happens. Right. Rather than falling over and letting somebody own your 
enterprise. Mm -hmm. So the education and training offerings are starting to make use of it. And we still have some way to go in our higher level training, education, certification, because you don't change certification, accreditation criteria in colleges and so on very fast. Right. Um, so we're, we're working on that, but, um, and it's not just MITRE. There's all these initiatives are basically where MITRE has seen a problem, a lot of other people have seen problems, and collectively we've come together to kind of carve off a small piece, try to get a solution that actually makes sense, both from a researcher, you know, it's got integrity, but also from a vendor that I, this makes sense, it's gonna help my product, it's gonna help me be more economical in delivering something to my customers, and to the customers that it starts to bring together no matter which vendor, no matter which service supplier I'm involved with, the things I get make sense. I can compose them together right. so I'm not locked in and when some new fantastic capability comes out, I can bring it in, I can use it together. Um, so a lot of those efforts have started to make headway, but cybersecurity has a lot of other aspects. So you have to configure your systems and lock them down. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, an effort in the federal government called SCAP, the Security Content Automation Protocol, that leverages standard languages, standard identifiers for aspects of how you harden a system. And in the federal government, they've started giving direction on how to do lockdown in these languages and enumerations or uh, registries so that machines can actually process it. For a long time, the industry has given narrative guidance on how to lock down a box, how to configure it. The trouble is when a person reads that, they may interpret it differently right. than the author. And mm -hmm. so by putting this in an XML document, the author can actually direct exactly how it should be interpreted. It's when this value has this value and that value of this registry has this value, no matter what the narrative words may mm -hmm. be a little vague about. And so a lot of people in industry are starting to find value in that. When Sarban Oxley came along a couple years ago and made the CEO, CIOs responsible for you know, knowing what systems they have and locking them down and being accountable. Well, the market at the time, w the tools that were in vogue, they each had their hardening approach and they measured against it. Mm -hmm. But the enterprise owners had no ability to tweak that. And yet Sarbanoxy came in and said, you are responsible, not the vendor. Right. And so all of a sudden those vendors saw all these enterprise owners saying, I need your tool to look for this set of guidance. Mm -hmm. And so the languages and enumerations in SCAP became a life-saving grace to these vendors instead of a threat. Right. Because, oh, okay, write whatever you want, I'll parse it and I'll interpret it and we'll give you the results. So it was a shift and it now makes it a little easier because enterprises can own the rule set Mm -hmm. Auditors can come in and say, okay, they, yep, that's what the rules say, and they can bring their own tool, independent of the one the you know, enterprise is using, and do spot checks and so on. So it, it really changes another part, and we call all of these initiatives making security measurable, and people say, oh, you're going to give us metrics. I said, well, no, we're trying to get no matter which tool, service provider, information, source, researcher you, you have helping you, the concepts, the items are consistent so you can actually bring them together and put together a metrics program based on whatever your business concerns are and in, are interests. Um, the most recent area of this is in information sharing about threats. Mm -hmm. Big thing, a lot of people have been talking about it for a long time and unfortunately, what we didn't realize was information sharing has two aspects. One is trust relationships, and the other is the actual moving the information. Mm -hmm. And so trust relationships seems to mean legally binding documents amongst the players. Um, so now those seem to happen fairly readily. But then you have this network 
of people that are legally bound to, you know, secure and keep confidential whatever you're sharing. But then what do you share? Mm -hmm. And so that, the, I don't know, I don't know if it's really the state of the art or it's just common practice, would be PDF documents or an email. And that's very hard to parse out. And, you know, let's say you gave me some information and some paragraphs were shareable and some weren't. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I get it out of that document? So we've been working with many of those sharing communities about how can you structure that thread information so that all the piece parts, basically a vocabulary, a structure, a architecture, a information architecture anyway. And this is something that one of my colleagues, Sean Barnum, briefed at a TurboTalk yesterday at Black Hat on sticks, the structured thread information mm -hmm. expression. And so the idea here is if you have this common vocabulary, think about the list of elements again, mm -hmm. Well, at least we're talking about the same things. And within one trust group, you may decide, all I'm going to share is IP addresses so I can have a blacklist. In another group, you may share something much more intimate and revealing about the kinds of attacks you're getting. And you don't want to share that with everybody, so you're going to have a tight trust relationship. Well, this sticks structure it lets you refer to those things unambiguously. And so there's a lot of interest, a lot of energy going on because it may break that loggerhead of how do we share information so that first victim can actually inform the community they're in. And if it's the right kind of data, that community can share it with another community and share it with another, right. rather than some big sharing warehouse in the sky yeah. that you know has armed guards around it. Mm -hmm. They have lots of little locked cabinets. Yeah. But, so Definitely. that's pretty much A to Z, uh, what we've been doing. Some of that work actually fans out into malware analysis, mm -hmm. into digital forensics work. Um, I guess the final thought I would like to share is, you know, in cyber, there's no reason for convergent in approaches. Mm -hmm. In other words, out here in the physical world, the laws of physics, you know, somebody who builds you know, how strong a structure has to be to take a certain amount of load, you're going to come to very similar approaches, no matter what you label it or how you measure it. In cyber, that, that's not a given. It's all man-made. Right. So what you call it, how you've kind of scoped it, the level of abstraction, all of that is totally free. And guess what? We have researchers and products and service based on all this chaotic approaches mm -hmm. and you can't take what you find in logs and use it what you find in malware with what you find in forensics. And so we have this initiative that's called Cybox, the Cyber Observables, trying to establish a kind of a base of what is an observable, what's that kind of abstraction. It's very complex, but most people will never see it because it'll be baked into the malware world on how they capture the malware parts. It'll be into the log people and how they do it. It'll be into the digital forensics. It'll be into the attack pattern analysis. So you basically won't see it, but it'll allow information from any tool or any service in any of those areas to be used in combination with the others and not have a disconnect, a, a dis schism, in approach, method, and, and concepts. Right. Which is unfortunately what we have quite often today. Absolutely. Build that periodic table. Yeah. <laughs> so people can memorize it. Well, or at least so the computers can remember it if you trust them. Yes, if you trust them. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Secure Ninja Shorts are brought to you by SecureNinja.com a world leader in information security and IT training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. SecureNinja.com, forging IT security experts. Yeah!